Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out uh, to our seventh lecture on ponds. And today it's on microorganisms. It's going to be a very small lecture. Um, <laughs> um, I'm Rob Davies with the Pond Committee. And we have some of our Pond Committee members here. Most of them, thank God. Otherwise, the audience would be short. And anyhow, uh, Paula is joining us again. Paula was our second our second seminar, I think. She came and talked about plants and stormwater ponds and so forth. Paula is with the public, she's a public education program coordinator at UCFIFAS, Extension Hillsborough County Board of Friendly Landscaping. Um, and uh, she conducts irrigation systems evaluation of high water users, educates the public on water conservation, irrigation maintenance, best management practices, she previously worked with the St. John's River Water Management District, helping residents with water conservation, homeowner associations, and managing their stormwater ponds and improve water quality. And she lectures quite a bit on lots of things to do with water friendly plantings and water and stormwater management. And we're very happy to have her back. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I'm really not the best on plants. I, I like the weeds. I think the weeds are interesting. I mean, I want to know about that plant on I-75 South, how it's still alive. The ones that you buy from the nursery that look really good, I'm not impressed. It should look good. It should look great, and it should do great. And when they fail, I'm like, yeah, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the ones that are looking good. So I used to work for the St. John's River Water Management District, and we did a lot of things with stormwater ponds then their focus would change and we would do a lot of things with water. So I'm going to talk today about the stormwater ponds, the life in the ponds, and then a lot of the life in the ponds, if it's a healthy pond, you cannot see. There is life above and life below, and they complement each other. They create a unique environment. Many aquatic insect larvae and microorganisms need to have cover. And the cover is provided by the aquatic plants around the edge. Some of them can find cover in mud, but to have the diversity that you really need to make a pond healthy, you really have to have a, a, an area where there are some plants. And I know there, it takes a lot to manage them because now there are plants in water. So you think about how much you have to do to manage your landscape at your home, yeah, you have to do the same amount or even a little bit more with the ponds, but they provide so many more services to the community when you have the healthy microflora and fauna. So this is just a little bit of all, if you look at all of the different things, they're all, <coughs> you know, the nitrogen, the carbon, the phosphorus cycle, it's all things that we use on the planet that contribute to the degradation of the stormwater pond. The pond can handle it in small amounts, but if we don't do our job above ground, then they really get, in the summer especially, less oxygen, more heat, the bacteria are a lot more active. I think I've talked about this. It really comes from the roads and off of our community. Uh, and this is, everybody always says, oh, it goes to a treatment plant. No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't go to a treatment plant. It goes right out into the waterways, you know, from your yard to the street, to the pond, to the discharge into the waterways. So you have to really be aware. You have to say, this is my yard and I'm going to make sure nothing escapes my yard except water. So this is a dry pond. This isn't what we're talking about today. A lot of, a lot of uh, swales are between the road and the driveway and they're sort of like conveyances, bringing them to a bigger pond. Here, uh, and also, they also discharge below ground and they enter into the surficial aquifer. So, but you won't find a lot of microorganisms there. So this is a wet detention detention pond and this is what it looks like underneath and the permanent pond is the one where you will get the reduction of the nitrates by the bacteria you don't want that filling in you know you have to make sure that the 
that the soil in your yard stays in your yard. If you have bare spots, you need to make sure that's covered. You have to get some ground cover, either get a patch of turf grass or some a ground cover that, you know, would go well with your landscape. I know you probably have to submit a, an application to change your landscape, um, especially as landscapes get bigger um, and more mature, there's, there's more shade. So then maybe turf grass won't grow. You have to have at least five hours of, of sunlight to really um, have turf grass grow. So this is a geochemical reduction and, and these things are occurring all the time. And, you know, if we don't overwhelm it, the, the, the seasons and the heating and the cooling and all of that, they can sort of manage it. But there's so many more of us on the planet and we have so many more chemicals that we use that it, you know, there's just too much for our environment. So we're going to look at the biological part of this equation. And there's, and this is where they occur. Some occur near the surface and those are photoautotrophs. Some occur in the middle. Those are chemoautotrophs. And we're going to discuss that a little bit, but not a lot. I know. So if you have a very healthy ledge of aquatic plants, you're going to have dragonflies. Now these are to the terrestrial form. Most, there's some dragonflies that really need to be in the water. They'll be there for like four years before they become terrestrial. And one of the things that I used to do when I was working for the St. John's River Water Management District was I, I would collect samples from water bodies and I would go to school and I would show them what, what the microorganisms or the, these are invertebrates, what they would look like. And one time I got done with a, with a presentation and so I had kept them all separate. You know, there's a lot of different types of dragonfly larvae. So I kept them all separate. I kept the mayflies separate and a lot of the other different kinds that I found, I kept them separate. And after the presentation, I just, I had put them in a big, big bowl and with a cap and I left it in the trunk of my car. And when I get up in the morning, the only thing that was left was the biggest dragonfly. He ate everything else except his own kind, but he ate all the other dragonflies, all the mayflies. I think he left a scud, which is a, something that will live in very poor water quality. So I guess it didn't taste very good, but yeah, it's really amazing. And they will eat everything. And so this is sort of like the macroinvertebrates. And this is what I would do with kids. And we would go out there, we would get a net and we would collect some of these. And then we would put them in, in a, like a big pan and we would keep them separate. You had to separate them kind of fast. You can't keep a big dragonfly larvae in there. If you have a mayfly or a stonefly, a gobson fly larvae, um, a wet water penny was really interesting. These are things that you can see that are in the water if there's healthy cover. And I, I had really, because I was doing stormwater ponds, it was only a very young stormwater pond that I would find good quality stuff over time. They really, unless there was a lot of well-maintained vegetation around the edge, you really wouldn't see um, mayflies or riffle beetle larvae uh, and, or a water penny. And I was, I thought it was a piece of, I thought it was a bottle cap. And I went down there to get it. And I thought it was like a dime, like a really shiny dime. And I thought, what is that? Is that a dime? And when I got down there and I pushed away the mud, I was like, oh my God, it's a water penny. I had really never seen a water penny before. So I want to play this um, video just so you can see what they look like underground. We're not going to do it very long. It's, it's pretty, uh, it's been there a while. Uh -oh. Let's see if I can find it. Here it is. So I, I was surprised they got this because these things are fast in their aquatic form. They're really not very big at all. You know, they're very fast. Ooh, it doesn't want to do it. So I think I can, I, so this is what it looks like terrestrial. 
And they're really only terrestrial for a couple of weeks. I think maybe I can bring it up. Can you guys hear that? Not yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not gonna. Because <laughs> I can't get the sound to work. But here they are under in the water. It's hard to see. But this this is so close to flight. I mean, he's got the legs, he's moving around. It's very close to flight, and that's really all they could get. And this, I think, is a stone fly. So if you were to go out into your ponds and you wanted to see the health of your ponds, they would be an indicator. Sorry. I can use both of these at sure. the same time. Yes, you can. I'll help you. Turn it on and then I can let them hear. Sure. Yeah, so see how they burrow in there? And, and these are pretty well formed, but a lot of times in the early stages, they're very small. But unlike other nymphs, they can rival small fishes with their ability to swim. Flexible body and streamlined profile make for a nearly perfect hydrodynamic form. Many of the swimmers lock their tails into a single paddle, which they use like a dolphin's flute. Though there are many exceptions to the rule, the typical mayfly nymph spends about one year underwater. They stay close to the protective gravel, which means that their cryptic coloration hides them from predators such as fish. And dragonflies. On the day that they are to molt into the adult form, many mayflies develop a shiny layer of gas beneath their translucent cuticle. As the gases increase, so does the nymph's buoyancy, and many have a hard time keeping a hold of the bottom. Finally overwhelmed by buoyancy, these nymphs are stripped from the bottom and floated into the unnatural and dangerous realm of open water. Many of these nymphs stubbornly fight the upward pool and repeatedly dive for the safety of the bottom, only to be carried upwards once again by the relentless pull of the trained <coughs> gases. Exhausted by the effort of fighting the drift, many nymphs lack the energy required to break through the rubbery surface film, and a huge percentage die in the struggle. And The nymphs with the highest survival rate are those that don't waste their strength fighting the upward pool and instead swim boldly towards the surface. These mayflies have plenty of energy and break through the film with ease. At the surface, the nymph punches through the film, its exoskeleton breaks open, and frees the adult mayfly within. This transition from a nymph to the adult is known as an emergence. So that's really all I'm going to show you about them. Um, they really... Um, all of the insects that are aquatic that basically have to struggle through the same thing, 
Did you notice that the ones that really made it up were the ones that were climbing up vegetation and they felt safe? A lot of times in wildlife, it's cover is more important than just about anything, safety, because it's really eat or be eaten in the insect world. And these are just different types of um, aquatic insects. So I think I'm gonna shut him down and I'm gonna shut this down. I hope I don't shut my thing off. Okay, so that is really all about the dragonfly larvae and mayfly larvae, some of the invertebrates that you would find in, in, in your stormwater ponds if there was cover. So this was the picture that, that was sent around to get you guys excited about my presentation and I was like, well, I better step it up. <laughs> so uh, the planaria in the bottom, in, be on your bottom left, in the bottom left-hand corner, that's actually visual. And you would be able to see that if you were collecting, um, you know, it, it, it's tiny, but you could still see it. The nematode on the right, second from the top, you would be able to see some of the nematodes, but anything else in here, you would not be able to see it. And, um, and so I thought, I used to look at these in the microscope at work. And when I worked as a lab manager for a wastewater treatment plant, and once a month I would go out and I would get a, a sample and I would look and see who was predominant and who was not predominant. And so I'm gonna show you this video, even I said really good. I was like so shocked. This is such a good video. If you're really interested in all of these smaller things that you can't see but should be in your pond, if you want dragonfly, you have to have dragonfly food. If you want mayfly, you have to have mayfly food. You have to have food, natural food for them. And you have to have cover because they're really trying to eat or be eaten. They really are. So let me see if I can get this thing. Science. It's brilliant. Despite huge differences in morphology and biological structures, all living organisms do the same three basic things. They get food, digest it, and excrete waste materials. Living organisms require energy to live. Some produce their own food, usually through photosynthesis. We call these autotrophs. But many organisms cannot make their own food. We call these heterotrophs, and they eat. This is a filter feeder. See how he's got this? Among heterotrophic single-cell eukaryotes, food is taken into the cell in various methods, but once it's there, it's wrapped by a membrane and forms something called a food vacuole. Then the cell flushes digestive enzymes inside the food vacuole to start the digestion. Nutrients are taken into the cytoplasm, and the waste material left in the vacuole then basically fuses with the outer membrane of the cell, and what's left in the vacuole is discharged is into the environment. The in some cases, like inside this beautiful single-celled Massilla ornata, which feeds on filamentous cyanobacteria, content of the food vacuole reacts with the digestive this enzymes and changes color. That process takes time. Because each vacuole formed at a different time, they are in different stages of digestion, which gives this cell its colorful polka dots. But how do these heterotrophic organisms get their food? Well, in spite of a remarkable amount of diversity, a lot of microorganisms use one of the same three strategies for getting their food. Some of this will be familiar to the macro world, some of it will not. One of the less familiar is filter feeding, which allows larger organisms to consume suspended food particles or much smaller organisms. There are filter feeders in the macro world, baleen whales come to mind. But while a whale must swim through giant clouds of small organisms in the microcosmos, your food can come to you. 
Some filter feeders use hair-like structures called cilia to create a vortex that brings other microorganisms or food particles to the cell mouth. These cilia are specialized for this task, and their beating creates a current that expediently and beautifully directs every nearby thing into the waiting mouth of the microorganism. The cilia are often too small for us to see, but you can see their effects. Take a look at these pyramecia. They're consuming tiny, tiny bacteria, and you can see their cilia causing small organisms to tumble across them. You can also see all of their food vacuoles on the inside, and if you look very carefully, you can see a new food vacuole forming and getting filled up with those tiny bacterial cells. Some of the best and most obvious filter feeders are rotifers, microanimals that use cilia to create swirling vortices around their mouth parts. You can see how successful this feeding strategy is by its belly full of algae cells. Every time its mouth fills with more algae, it contracts to swallow the food. Now observe these single-celled organisms called stenters. They are much bigger than most other microorganisms. You can actually see them with the naked eye. And they also use filter feeding to push all of their algal food into their cell mouths. Our second feeding mechanism, maybe the most familiar and the most exciting, is called raptorial feeding. Raptorial feeders selectively capture prey and hunt other organisms. In this video, you can see Deleptus hunting. It paralyzes one organism with the touch of its trunk-like proboscis, and then it pulls that organism into itself in a process called phagocytosis. Many of these microorganisms are armed with something called toxicists. These are little harpoon-like structures filled with toxins, and they're located on a particular part of the cell which the microorganism uses for hunting. These tiny harpoons are then fired when they come in contact with prey organisms, which then become immobilized. This is Bursaria. It's a single-celled organism with a huge mouth, and things have not gone well for the paramecium that is now inside it. The paramecium dies immediately because of the toxicists on the inside of the Bursaria, so at least it was quick. Now get ready for some truly gorgeous footage of a microanimal's day going south. First, Paradeleptus immobilizes the rotifer with fired toxicists, and the animal is swallowed by the single-celled organism as it swims away. This is Frontonia, which is a close relative of Paramecia, but it lacks the filter-feeding habits of its relatives and feeds predaciously on large diatoms and filamentous cyanobacteria, such as Oscillatoria here. Though, in this case, it turns out this Frontonia bit off a little more than he could chew. Another raptorial feeding style is called histophagy. Histophagus organisms, such as these single-celled collapse, attack injured but live animals or other single-celled organisms, sucking off hunks of tissue rather than consuming whole organisms. When they attack an animal, they enter wounds and ingest tissue, often attacking in groups because their chemical sensing abilities attract many of them from a distance, like microscopic vultures. When a number of them gather in one place, it's hard to avoid another macro-world analog, piranhas, devouring everything soft in no time at all. There's a huge variety of raptorial feeding. This is just the beginning, but we wanted to show you one more before we move on. This is Vampirella, an amoeba with a suitable name. It specializes in feeding on filamentous algae. First, it bores a hole through the algal cell wall and then slurps out the gooey, nutritious cytoplasm.
Our final feeding mechanism, for today at least, is diffusion feeding, in which the predator just sits in the same place, relying on the prey to accidentally make contact. This is a heliozoa. It's a single-celled amoeboid, and because of its resemblance to the sun, due to the rays coming out of its cell, it's sometimes called the sun animalcule. The rays are called axipodia. These are sometimes used in locomotion, and in this case, for hunting prey. Axipodia are cytoplasmic extensions, meaning they're a part of the cell membrane, even though they look like they're sticking out of it. Each one has a central supporting rod of microtubules that gives it this rigid structure. The axipodia are coated in organelles that discharge toxins when touched, which impair or even paralyze heliozoa's prey. After the organism is captured, those microtubules are drawn back into the cell, thus retracting the axipodia and allowing the cell to swallow the unlucky organism. Or, prey is just engulfed by extrusions from the cell called pseudopodia. In this video, a rotifer has been captured by a heliozoa and is slowly getting eaten by it. Now this is something that happens fairly frequently, but we did capture something unusual here. While it was stuck to heliozoa's axipodia, this rotifer actually lays its egg, but neither egg nor the rotifer is going to escape this. Surprisingly heartbreaking. This is a Suctorium. It's a ciliate, just like Paramecium and Stentor. These organisms have hair-like cilia during the early stage of their life, but as adults, they develop bundles of tentacles. Just like in Heliozoa, these tentacles... Is that enough? It's, it's almost <laughs> at the end. So you guys, is it too much? It's great. It's really... I, I, saw, I would look into the microscope, and this was the guy that I never could understand. I didn't really see him too much. And he looked like, you know, didn't do anything. And now I'm reading like it, it's got, this is bad, this guy. <laughs> so um, I'll finish it out. I, I think it's another, yeah, not much. Tentacles are supported by an internal cylinder of microtubules. The tip of the tentacles have extrusomes. These are special structures that attach to and immobilize any other ciliates that touch them. The tentacles eventually penetrate the cell membrane of the prey, and then the contents of the prey is sucked out through the tentacle. In this clip, a suctorian has caught four individual vorticella with its tentacles and is slowly sucking their cytoplasm. It looks a little like the vorticella have the suctorian surrounded, but in fact, they are powerless to escape it. It's a dangerous world out there. The complex chemicals created by organisms to sustain their life necessarily are useful to other organisms as building blocks and as fuel. And so predation evolved. It's beautiful, it's constant, and it's brutal. Thank you for watching and for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. That was bad, right? Yeah. My gosh, all of this going on. It's every day, every week I would look in, because I worked at, it was domesticated waste, and so I would look at the biomass, and I would like take just a drop, and I would look and see what's going on, and, um, they're really indicator organisms for the health of the, the biomass or the, the tank. So whatever was predominating, I could tell basically the quality of it. Like, did it have a lot of organic? Was it, you know, if it had a lot of rotifers, then that means it was pretty well aged because they're kind of big and that the effluent wouldn't have a lot of organic load going out. And if it had a dominated with ciliates, then it had a little more organic load, but it had the oxygen it needed. So um, I just thought that's what the picture that was sent around, so I thought I'd talk about it. Did anybody find it interesting, or am I the only nerd here? No, no. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's great. So this, I took put this in here because this is um, a study, and they actually collected these kinds of things, and some of them are, and, and they're insect, but you see, they collected a rotifer. 
So here it is in a retention pond, probably from a storm water that the bottom, they had 39, but in a constructed wetland, they only had one. Um, but yet they had a variety and a diversity in the constructed wetland <clears throat> that you would want to see in your stormwater pond. And I tried to do some research, like what, what are they talking about? What kind of constructed wetland? And I, I couldn't really um, figure out what the difference was. I know when I worked at a wastewater, wastewater treatment plants, what the idea of a constructed wetland was the effluent would run through the wetland and then you would have all these different plants that you would find native along like, I, I work up in Nassau County, Florida, so you would, uh, maybe along the St. Mary's River, you would have certain sedges, certain different types of plants, and these plants would further remove the nitrogen as they grew, but the problem with it was that the, the geese found it, all these big birds found it, so they would come and they would make nests in it, and then they would poop in there and they would raise the fecal coliform. So then you would fail your permit limits. So they stopped putting those out there. But I can see that this is really, you know, this is really the idea is that you would have healthier water as it left. So this is just a, um, a diagram of what happens to protestin, which is what those we just looked at are protes. And so they're feeding on bacteria um, and how much is left for the bacteria. And the cell size really determines it. And so if you're going to have a healthy pond, you kind of have to know, you have to have enough cover for everything and you don't want one species to dominate over another. Or you'll get the little tiny stuff is where you'll find the bacteria. So in the deep pool is where the bacteria will actually break apart the molecules of nitrogen, um, phosphates, and so these different names of the bacteria um, are located at different depths. And so that's the idea with a stormwater pond. But because we have a lot of runoff, uh, the, that brings in sand and fills in the pond, then you don't get this kind of action. You don't get them in there long enough to break apart the nitrogen, to break apart the phosphates. And so it's key to have homes that have good ground cover, such as turf grass or, you know, any of the Florida friendly landscapes that if you have, you have to follow the, the nitrogen. You did, how many of you know you're not supposed to put nitrogen on your turf grass after June? You're not supposed to fertilize after June. Yes, thank you, somebody. Because what happens is when the rains come, it just washes it all off into your stormwater pond. Now you've put a lot of nitrogen in here. It's hot. These big things, they're, they're not gonna use a lot of, you know, the ciliates and, and the invertebrates they're not gonna move around in that pond because there's not a lot of oxygen. And so only the bacteria that can do that are the ones that will break it apart. But if it's not deep enough, you're not gonna get the diversity of the bacteria to break down these molecules. Is that too much science? My boss says all the time, you talk too much science. <laughs> so this is uh, part of that study and I, we're not gonna really go into it that much but I, you can see that they have the wetland type over on the left. And then right in the middle, um, you see the, the, in, the inflow source. So they were checking stormwater runoff, stormwater runoff, but then you see a lot of domestic waste, a lot of domestic waste. Then there was some dairy farms, um, some industrial waste that was in there. I just took out the stormwater and I blew it up big. And you can see what they were looking at. Like sometimes they were looking at the community or they wanted to know if the ammonia oxidizing bacteria, they were looking to see what kind was in there. So that's the second one down. And I thought it was really interesting. And then they actually show how much nitrogen is removed. And it's done a little bit differently. Like the first one does that NO2 to N in hour per grams in dry mass. The next one does it, you know, grams per meter squared per day. So they have different rates that they check, but these are the kinds of, it takes a long time to do this. 
So I went through this, but I, I feel like it's just a little bit too much, but I, I couldn't stop myself. I was like, stop. <laughs> and I could not stop myself. <laughs> Here's urban runoff. I mean, they really look at a lot of different things. And then there's all other things here as well, like the study wants to know what kind of bacteria, and sometimes they have an experimental. You can see here's an experimental one. So here's an experimental type of uh, wetland that they're trying to see. How, you know, what is it working? How is it working? And so there's a lot of study um, on the effects and the type of bacteria that would actually, or prokaryotes, eukaryotes, and then um, archaea, which I learned a lot when I was doing this. You know, archaea are linked by some sort of liquid in their body. You know, bacteria have protons, eukaryotes don't, and the archaea it was like, yeah, we can of whatever is not left, whatever's left is kind of how it's linked. It was really, um, but what you're looking for in your stormwater pond are the purple bacteria. And so the protea, they are the dominant. And they, uh, phototrophs, which would be near the surface, because they need light, and that's why you get a lot of algae. And um, then the chemotrophs and the organotrophs, they take down the organics. This is a filamentaceous algae, and uh, it's blown up microscopically. So how they reduce it is because in their simplicity, they can actually, for especially nitrogen, it has three oxygen attached to the end. So they can actually take an electron and then get the oxygen. So they can accept an electron. They can accept oxygen's electron. Or they can donate an electron. When we, when in our cellular respiration, when we breathe in, you know, we're bringing in oxygen because as we eat carbon, whatever we don't use, our cells have to have a way to get it out of us. And so that's why it, we, it uses oxygen. Um, if we could find something else that had that same kind of electron availability, we could use that. But we don't. And because we, have, we take so much energy, we need something that has a lot of energy. But they're small. They can do it on less. And so this just shows you the different reactions and how they do nitrogen. These are all colored slides. You would never see purple. You just would never see it in, in, the, in the slide but they have it here so that you can see the different types. And so that's why I put it in there. There's a lot of... Um... So these are actually uh, pictures. This one on the right is called a Wagoneski. I've never seen it. I was, thought this was really interesting. It's a column, it's a big column, and they take a pond sample with some muck, and then they throw carbon in there and they see what grows. And so you can see the protein bacteria growing in this on the right. And I thought that was really interesting. And, and that is how they reduce the nitrates and the phosphates and the carbon. And they can do it in an oxygen zone and in an anoxic zone, which means very little. So this is a stained slide. That's why you can actually see it. And they do that so that they can um, use carbon in their body. That's what fixation means here. And it's a photolithoautotrophic growth. But I just, I just thought the pictures were great. And just a little bit of variety of all the different times, types of bacteria and uh, archaea that work within a healthy pond. Oh, this was, this is, um, I have to get my paper. This is a sulfur bacteria that was found in a cave in central Florida. And um, that is a strand of elemental sulfur that it is using to complete one of the either respiration or fixing something to its body. And so that's an actual image of the elemental sulfur. At first I thought it was a bacteria, but no. No, it's the elemental sulfur and it's in there being used by this bacteria, which probably broke it apart from something. And I couldn't really find a good picture of a chemo-organo growth, but you can see, you know, all the different ways that they have to um, utilize 
a lot of the nutrients and the inorganics that end up in a pond from the things that we use. So if we could just control what we have, it would be more balanced. Um, it really exists everywhere. And so the best bet is to make a pond so that the, the do you remember that graph? Well, the little tiny ones are left and that's a lot of that is algae. And then I blew that up big because I was like, this is a type of algae, it has a crust. But you can see all the different things like non-phototrophic bacterial biofilm. Um, there's a sponge in there. There's a filamentaceous cyanobacteria in there. Um, so there's all these different things that are a part of it. And, and that's kind of how they control the pond look. Oh, I put this in there. I thought this was really cool. <laughs> I'm going to let you guys read it. You want me to read it for you? Right, 200 years ago, Captain Cook thought he saw land. No, no, he didn't see land. He saw an algae bloom that looked like a sandbar. So I, I just, you know, bac bacteria, you know, have been growing, um, you, know, or, you know, since time began. They probably started life. And it's, they're here, so we just have to manage the, the pond. So the first thing is do not fertilize within 10 feet of the pond. Honestly, if you keep putting fertilizer on the edge of the pond like that, on the turf grass up to the edge, you're never gonna get control of the pond. And then you see this, this little sandbar and how if you don't have plants, you start losing the edge of the pond. You really, homeowners really need to try to do that. I know that a lot of that's out of your control, but I don't know, try. So this just is sad. And I hate to say it, but I took it here. So <clears throat> you can have a very pretty landscape around the edge of the pond, but yeah, it's gonna take some managing. It is a stormwater pond with plants and they're in water all the time. They're just gonna grow. And the, you have to select plants that are slow growing and they have to be maintained. You probably, just like your landscape, you have somebody come once a month and, and look at your, your landscape plants. You know, you have to have somebody come and take out and remove the plants. You can't, can't just kill them because the nitrates and phosphates will go back into the water stream. You have to remove them. But if you want this natural kind of pond that you thought you were living on, then you have to do things to um, make sure that the microorganisms and the invertebrates are, have a place to hide and feed. So these are just some other areas, I mean, some other looks that I thought were really nice. You wanna make sure when you have irrigation, you don't over-irrigate. Um, if a lot of people have the roof drain, they have it come down and go into their driveway. I mean, now you're putting a lot of coliform in your stormwater pond air deposition in your stormwater pond because it goes right down the driveway. You really should put a pop-up in the front yard or in the side yard, and when it comes down, the pop-up will pop in the middle of the landscape. So if you have a large area, that's where you put it, and then it gets, it gets water. And you don't, that's water that you're originally, you know, running down the driveway. And this is a picture of um, the, men, the river that's just south of here, one summer. And so that's me. <laughs> so, was that too much, Sean? Um, do you have any questions? I do have a game. I don't know if you guys want to play a game. <laughs> you want to try a game? I do have questions about the plants that we saw around the pond that were flowering. Uh huh. A lot of our residents would love to have flowering plants around the pond. So do you have recommendations? I, I know that a lot of people are worried that they won't see the pond. I would say blue mist flower doesn't grow very high. If you guys wanted to come out and look at the bog, come out in about yeah, two months and look at the bog. I have a ton of blue mist flower going. 
I have a star sedge that I really like, although I wouldn't put it in a pond. That thing is, it just it doesn't know how to behave. Um, I have like the prettiest little helmet, snapdragon, and all of these are right along the edge and they don't grow very high. Um, and these are some of the things that you would do. Some of the bigger lilies, they would be down lower. I don't really think it would block the view of most homes because most ponds really, they kind of have a show, you know, they have, they kind of curve up to the house. So you just need to, uh, I think and before you buy something, you see how tall it gets. So right, you see how tall it gets. Yeah, definitely. Um, you wouldn't want a hyacinth. We have like a sort of a, a hyacinth. I think you go eight feet. No, you wouldn't want that in your in your pond. Um, but there's like duck potato. Duck potato says it grows high, but what grows high on the duck potato is the the flower. But it's just this big long rod with a bunch of little tiny things. The actual leaves really don't go any higher than three feet. Um, would you like to see what it would be like as if you collected invertebrates and then see whether the water quality is good or bad? That's my game. Would anybody like to try that? <laughs> I think it would be fun. So we're doing it. <laughs> you don't have to do it if you don't want to.